this morning, if there is anyone who is less qualified to do anything out here, it's me, because uh, there are very well great scholars in this place. I'm going to do, do a vain attempt or, a great, or uh, my best attempt at talking to you something that is very close to my heart this morning. That is, unchanging God in changing seasons. See, seasons of life, just like there is seasonal changes for the geography of this world, there are seasonal changes in personal life. Changing seasons are certainty of life. Values and morals have changed our culture so much so that people take to the side, you are, whether you belong to the right or to the left. Every four years you will see that this is the most cataclysmic or this is the most consequential election in this country and you are hearing one right now. People, people look at themselves as either to your right or to the left. The values are changing which one value is affected and offends one group and then another value affects the another group. We must, if you look, there are seasons in life that things change. Losing loved ones, losing a job, moving from one place, family dispersion, because, and, and, and we know we are the diaspora from India. We know what it is to leave families and be here. Things are very unsettled during changing seasons. But I want to tell you this morning, there is something that is very settled and very settled so much that we must hold on. That is a God who never changes. He never changes. His being never changes. His perfections cannot be changed. He cannot be altered. We cannot, we can count on the unchanging God in the changing seasons of our lives. Maratha Devate, Maratha Devate, Namada Mar in the Jewdangal, Mari country in the Jewdangal, Namaka Pritika on the Anna, or a pull over Devam. In theological terms, this is referred as the immutability of God. God is immutable, He is unchanging, He is unchangeable, not subject to any change. His, his perfection, He is perfect. His perfection is devoid of any change. His perfections, his purpose, his promises never change. That is a special. But in this changing world, as Christians, we have to go through the changes in order to feel the presence of God in your life. If you think that life is always very happy, Things are always, life is very linear. It will be, it will not be exciting. You will not, you will think that God is always, your life is linear. You will think that God is always linear. You will think that God is always linear. Seasons of life is important for you to see the God of seasons in your life. The God of seasons intervenes into the season of your life that you are in. So can he make and he can make something special out of what you are going through. We call this in, 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 in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12 and 13 it says, Beloved, do not be surprised. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial. When it comes upon you, do not be surprised. Seasons are going to change. Do not be surprised. We are, this is a season for pruning. Season to prove you. Season to perfect you. Seasons that God encases our lives and protects him when you are going through stuff in your life. But he says, he is testing you. Do not be surprised as though something strange is happening. Expect seasons. Expect it. Whether you are inside of a season, coming out of, or out of it, or you are getting into it. As we say, 
but rejoice in so far that you can share Christ in that season in your life. Rejoice in so much so that Christ can be manifest. Rejoice in so much so that Christ can be tasted in your life. Rejoice in so much so that God, you can see that refuge that is a very present God in your season. And be glad that His glory can be revealed. One thing is certain. The seasons test your faith. Expect God's fire. In order to expect God's fire, then you can experience God's faithfulness in your seasons. God's faithfulness. Then, in that season, you can exhibit that you love God. That you love God. There is nobody who has not been tested. Every Bible character, including Jesus Christ. There was the Gethsemane. There was the Gabbatha. There was a Golgotha. Psalmist says this. When you go through this. Oh how abundant. How great. Is the goodness that comes to you in this season. Because he has stored those things. For you. Because you fear God. He works out those things that you are going through. For your own good. Refuge. You take refuge in him. And then you become a witness for him before the sons of men. God expects you to trust him. God expects you to fear him so that he can bless the seasons of your life and make it into something special for you. It is important. When you fear God and serve him, you are going to see the glory of God in your life. You are the reason for you to get anywhere to God's. Goodness should be that he sent you through some school of teaching. It is earned by fearing God and trusting in the situations of your life. It is a time that you taste. It is a time that you take refuge. It is a time you see the third man walking with you. It is a time that you see that he's carrying you. And you look back and see, oh God has been so special to me. ദൈവത്തെ രുചിച്ചറിയാൻ നമുക്കൊരു സന്ദർഭം ദൈവത്തെ അറിയേണ്ടത് പോലെ അറിയാൻ നമുക്കൊരു സന്ദർഭം ദൈവത്തെ കാണുന്നതിന് പോലെ കാണാൻ നമുക്കൊരു അവസരം ദൈവം തരും ദൈവത്തിൻ്റെ നന്മ നമ്മുടെ കഷ്ടതയിൽ കൂടെ പോകുമ്പോഴാണെങ്കിലും നമ്മുടെ പ്രയാസവേളയിൽ ദൈവത്തിൻ്റെ നന്മ വെളിപ്പെടും ഐ ലൈക്ക് ദിസ് കോട്ട് ഗാഡ്സ് വർക്ക് ഷോപ്പ് സീസൺസ് ചാൾസ് ഫോർജൻ സേസ് ദിസ് ഐ ബെയർ വിറ്റ്നസ് ദർ ഐ ഓ more to the fire and the hammer and the file than to anything else in my lord's workshop i sometimes question whether i have learned anything except through the rod when my classroom is darkened i see the most see how beautiful that is when the classroom when you cannot see anything the lord is leading you it is so beautiful i want there is I want to talk to you this morning about something that I can I want to I want to pinpoint somebody's season in their lives. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. I want to talk about Isaiah, the changing seasons in his life. It says Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting up upon a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple above him stood seraphim he had six wings with two he covered his face and with two he covered his feet and with two he flew and one called to another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke and i said oh is me for i am lost and i am a man of unclean lips i dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king and the lord of hosts then one of the seraphim flew to me having in his hand a burning coal that he has taken with tongs an altar from the altar and he touched my mouth and said behold 
This has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, I, Here I am. Send me. And he, he said, Go and, and say to the people, Say this to the people. Speak to us, Father. See, Isaiah wrote the first five chapters. He gets into the point of what he wants to say because Judea was in a beautiful place for the last 52 years. And he gets in and he comes to chapter 6 and goes back and talks about his conversion. I, Bible, does not, Bible is not clear about how old he was, but Isaiah was a scholar. If you look to Second Chronicles chapter, um, I think it was in 26 and verse 21, it says, Isaiah wrote about the, has written a book about the, the, the kingdom of Uzziah is, is ruling. We don't find it, but it is written there. So what I'm saying, Isaiah knew very much. The, the country was going well. Everything was beautiful. He was the 10th king of Judah. 52 years of blessing. 52 years of great time of prosperity. A consistency and comfort. There was great walls were built. The walls were beautiful. There was 52 years of peacefulness. People were mesmerized by the accolades of, by the, by the, by the wisdom and power of King Uzziah. They were mesmerized by the accomplishment he has done. It was a great time, a great economy. They lost focus of the real king, I'm thinking. Suddenly, the king dies. Second Chronicles chapter 15, chapter 15, 2 Kings chapter 15, and 2 Chronicles chapter 26 talks about this. And this king, even though the later phase, something special about this king, he was a godly man, powerful king. He was a very good king, but towards the end, he wanted to usurp the, power, the, 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 the rights of the Levites. And he became a leper. He died a leper. I tell you, the laws of the Lord cannot be violated in your blessing. Just because you're blessed. The laws of the Lord has to be kept. The eyes of the people were upon the king. Even Isaiah, I'm thinking. I'm just speaking from my imagination. Isaiah was also. But it was a big chaos. Big confusion. What, where are we going? Things like that happen in our lives. There are big things happening in our lives. There's confusions. Suddenly, abruptly, something happened. Things change. We are far from our comfort zone. We don't know what to do. Isaiah says, the year that he died, what did Isaiah do? He says, his eyes started focusing on the king. Now his eyes is wandering and it comes to a focus of God. He says, in the year, Isaiah, the Uzziah died. Isaiah focused. Before that, I'm thinking Isaiah's focus was on the king. Now he focuses. He refocuses. He says, he, he said, he looks to the king. Eyes are focused to God, who is the king, who never changes. He's, I, he's, he is not caught up with the culture, as we just said. He is not caught up with anything. He is a stable God. You see, you have to see God for who he is. He is an unchanging God in the seasons of your lives. You have to see, he is always sitting on the throne. He doesn't have any changes. He was and he is and he will be the same. He is high and lifted up. Seasons change, but God remains. Stand firm on the promises of God. His promises never change. His purposes never change. His principles never change. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of God stands forever. God stands forever. Dear children of God, Isaiah got a good view of God. When we get a proper vision of God, you and I will get an upper view of who he is. I'm sorry, I'm trying to best with my Malayalam. You cannot, we have to change, dear children of God. We have to change. When you see God in the right context, He will give you proper vision to who He is. 
Isaiah saw God high and lifted up in spite of all the turmoil that is going on in the country. In spite of all the turmoil that is going internally, he saw God in his right place. The Lord of hosts is seated. He remains the same. He remains steadfast. He remains strong in situations of your life and my life. We have to change. You cannot be the same after you have a vision from God. When you see Isaiah cannot be same. Expect to do a new thing. You cannot be the same and expect God something to do new, something new in your life. It requires a collaboration with you and God. You see, it is, I, I, you know, if I can finish, I'll finish. But I'll tell you, it is important that we knew, we need to align with God during this time. We need to align with God. See, Isaiah aligned. Isaiah saw something. When you align with God, he will convict you. And when you align with God, he will take you away from your focus. He will convert, he will, he will, he will have a conversation with you and he will speak to you in the situation and he will convert you. And then he will commission you. It is, that's what happens. He said, let, let, let's see, look at, the, look at how Isaiah's life changes after he saw. How we align with God. How his ways, work, words, and witness changed after he had a vision of God. It is important that he see the alignment needed for you and me is seen there. We need to see what Isaiah saw. Three things. We need to sense what Isaiah sensed. We need to say what Isaiah said. Three things. If, we can, if I can get to this. For, what, are the, what are the three things? First, we need to see what Isaiah saw. What did Isaiah see? Isaiah saw in spite of all the turmoil that is going on. He saw God's position in his life. God's position in his life. Isaiah saw God's position. Can we move the slide? He saw the sovereignty of God. He saw, he understood God is in control. He saw God is in control. He saw the personality of God. He saw God is holy. He saw the personality. He saw the central character of God. God may be merciful. God is graceful. God is powerful. God is, he is unchanging. But his central character is that he is holy. Because of his holiness, we honor God. And he saw what is going on in heaven. Let me tell you what is going on in heaven. Isaiah saw this some 800 years before John saw it. But what Isaiah saw and what John saw in Revelation chapter 4 is the same thing. They are singing the same song. We don't change. They sing the same song. Holy, holy, holy. The worship is going on. It's the same. Holy, holy. He saw the presence of God. The house was filled with smoke. He saw the train, the power, the majesty of God much more bigger than the majesty of King Uzziah. He saw. This is what we need to see. I want to talk about the holiness in a minute. How holiness changes us. We, need, we also need to sense what Isaiah sensed. What did Isaiah sense? When he saw the holiness of God, he looked upon himself. He sensed his own condition. He sensed his own cleansing. He, when he saw his own condition, he instantly realized that his heart is not clean. He instantly realized his focus has been away from God. He instantly realized moving close to God has revealed his own condition. Then, immediate upon that revelation, he says, I want to be cleansed. He provides a means for Cleansing a life coal, in your case and in my case, the precious blood of Jesus Christ that was shed upon that cross. See, what Isaiah saw and what Isaiah sensed is revealed by the holiness of God. Even if I don't speak anything, if I can get to this, I know you have heard many times the holiness of God preaching. But what is the holiness of God? Isaiah's sense, what he saw and what he sensed, is augmented. And it was magnified by the holiness of God. See, God is mercy, God is compassionate, I said. But 
it is the holiness of God that makes him the light of the world. That makes him, that, that is a central character as we just said. Holiness of God is mentioned, prophet, Anaya, prophet Isaiah mentions the Holy One 30 times. The entire Bible has 632, 37 times the mention, the word referred to God as holy. Here it says, holy, 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 the worship, that trihegion. The, it's, it's, this is only, this, these are the only two places where the holiness is augmented. The seriousness of this holiness is holy. He's holy and he's holy. The trihegion. As we say. See, it influences us. The holiness of God influences us in four ways. What are the four ways? First, how does holiness affect us? First, holiness means separation. Hebrew word for holiness is kadosh. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. It means to cut off, to separate, to be cut, separate. It is so, or it, if, see, ordinary objects are, are becoming holy objects, holy vessels, in Exodus chapter 40, we read how vessels are separated, how Aaron's clothes are separated. These are all holy vessels. When the holiness of God comes in, he, holiness separates, it cuts off something. It is separated. It is unique. It is totally singular. Holiness of God is totally singular. See, it is important that we understand that. So, it is, so if, if holiness magnifies corruption. The moment you find out the alignment that, you in your, that, that is needed in your season, as Isaiah said, Oh, is me. Oh, is me. Oh. In seeing God, Isaiah saw himself. Isaiah is not the only one who felt this way. Isaiah is, you see, and it is important that we understand the holiness of God magnifies our corruption. Namada Pavate, Velipatina, or is under Pon Deva Tinda Village and Namada Jeeva Tilverim Bowl. When the when the power of God comes into our life, it's it understand makes you understand that holiness means separation. There is a difference between you. You are suffering and somebody else is suffering because you have God with you. Holiness of God comes in that separates you. Then holiness magnifies corruption. There is no hope for, you, you see, what I'm saying, he says, there is nothing that I can do. The New English Version says, there, Isaiah translated, there is no hope for me, for I am ruined. This is what Isaiah felt. In seeing God, Isaiah saw himself. He is not, only, he is not the only person who saw it. The holiness magnifies the corruption. There are many people in the Bible who saw it that way. Job saw it. When Job saw in 42, verse 5 and 6, when God started speaking to him, Job said, I have only heard of you by hearing, but now I see you with my own eyes, and therefore I auber myself. I am ashamed of myself, therefore I see myself, so I repent. In dust and in ashes, when Job saw God as he is, he, even though he was holy man, what did Job say? What, what, did, what did God say about Job? He's a righteous man. That was a call. Of, he, was a, he was blameless. He was upright who feared God. But still, when he had an encounter with God, when he saw him, he said, I don't see what I, I don't like what I see in me. Therefore, I repent in ashes and dust. And he goes down. Peter, in chapter 5 of Luke, God tells him to cast the net. He says, I am the Mr. Fisherman. But when Peter saw the results, when he realized it, it was Jesus, he said, Lord, depart from me. I am a sinful man. I he said, Peter did not know who he was dealing with. The moment he found out that it was Jesus, the moment he found out, he fell to his knees. In English Standard Version, this is what it says. I mean, in Message Version, it says, Master, leave. I am a sinner. And I can't handle this holiness. 
leave me alone leave me to myself when holiness of god comes you we cannot compare you cannot be say that your righteousness because you are comparing some to somebody's unrighteousness nammulu veliya bhaktara nu parayum mattalla oru bhakti undengil adu kandu nu parayum nammulu bhaktara nu it is not for you to feel good because you are better than someone else you are to compare yourself to the holiness of god and then you will see it will reveal something if you go to the throne room of god the 24 elders they are taking off their crown they are throwing it down on the ground and say holy holy we are not worthy let me tell you don't come to god with your fake righteousness and holiness max lucero says it this way don't try to impress the officials at nasa with your paper airplanes don't boast about your crayon sketches in the presence of picasso you might say that you are a good basketball player right don't boast in front of michael jordan if you are a good golf player you don't want to go in front of tiger woods don't boast your holiness our righteousness before a holy god don't bring your paper airplanes to church don't bring your holy crayons to church it is skip says it skip isaac i read a lot of him he says show me a prideful person and i can show you a person who has never had an encounter with god meeting god will do something to you to deflate your pride so much so that even a prophet like isaiah next to the purity and holiness of god will say and cry oh is me that is the holiness of god that is the holiness of god is your who is your holiness and righteousness compared to the next or to the word of god i leave that for you to ponder third thing holiness means separation holiness means corruption holiness means purification immediately when god reveals something you got to do something about it you have to do something about this this thing that you found out you must do time to be real with god confess god then he says he immediately saw and he said i am a sinful man god says let me let me fix you the angels are ministering seraphim the angels bring and cleanse him in the old testament he said i have a mouth problem that was his confession i have a mouth problem oh is i have i live among filthy people i have a filthy mouth i live among people who are filthy who speak filthy things what is our problem this morning if god comes to us in my church i'll say do you have an addiction problem you have a gossiping problem you have a problem with disrespecting people you you disregard people what is our problem can we be real with god isaiah said i have a mouth problem and he cleansed it it your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged symbolic of cleansing a man with unclean lips that's what happened at the cross of calvary i have a sin problem i have a heart problem that's what the sinner says i have a heart problem unholiness cannot coexist with holiness lesson from that is this god must destroy what is unholy god must remove sin this is the story of the bible is in the devathin the, the, the uh, this is not the story of the bible bible in the kada idalle take a call touch the areas of people lives in their hearts in their minds in their decisions by cleansing it with the blood of jesus the old testament tabernacle they brought the animal they laid the sit the sin was the animal was slain and the blood is shed and your sin is atoned god god did that upon the cross for you and for me in that moment god the father and jesus were judicially separated from the father so that the weight of the sin fell on him he was purging our sin your sin my sin purifying and taking away and redeeming as that coal work that 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 isaiah saw was done upon the cross for christ died for us once for all the righteousness for 
the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. This is the story of the gospel. Is it not the gospel? This is the gospel. The message of the gospel is that the righteous one died for the unrighteous so that he can declare the unrighteous one righteous. Hello. This is beautiful. Isaiah understood the gulf between unholy him and the holy God. Oh, is me. Neatly sums it up. People go to church and call themselves Christian all their lives, but there is no change in him. We see Christian counterfeits in churches. Christian counterfeits. There is nothing, there is nothing to do with holiness. They have religion, but they have no relationship. They don't know God. They don't know the holiness of God. They identify with God. I'm a Christian, but they don't imitate what God is. They don't imitate. Identifying Christ, but not living a Christian life. Identifying with Christian, but not living a Christian, a Christian life. And also they pronounce the promises. If you tell them at work, there are many people, at churches, there are many people. I can do all things through Christ. He will work everything for good for me. You proclaim his promises, but without practicing the principles. It is important that we practice the principles. Thank you.